This video has been a long time coming. A lot of people have watched my Web01 video and have been asking me when's the second video going to come out and as yet I haven't got round to actually producing one. So finally I'm hoping that I will make up for it with a few more videos to do with uh, web application development. The first video, um, I am absolutely amazed it's become so popular because it's really not production ready. Uh, the whole idea of the whole video was for use for my students to actually build a login system. So there's a lot of problems with it and if you were to use it in the real world uh, there could be a lot of issues that could be uh, very quickly seen. For example there's something known as an SQL injection attack and there is absolutely no protection against this in the use that we've uh, put together in Web01. Uh, another major problem is there's no encryption on the database. Encryption is a way of hiding information in such a way that even if someone got access to it, they wouldn't be able to do anything with it, like a, a code, a secret code. And um, if anyone had access to the database in your login systems that you create from Web01, they'd have access to the passwords as well. So obviously that needs to be changed. It's also not very well structured if you want to actually extend the project on to do other things. So I thought I'd start to address these because at the moment we're coming up to this thing that they've called the year of code. Um, as I'm recording this it's currently 2014, it's actually February, and in the UK, uh, which is where I'm based, the government have this huge initiative to try and get as many people as possible into the world of computer programming and coding. It is a good idea. Um, I'm a computing lecturer in my real day job and I think that these videos and other videos and ways of trying to help people learn to program is a really useful thing and really does help people um, understand the digital world around them. But the problem is this year of code appears to have been sort of hijacked slightly uh, in so much as people think that if you create a bit of a website using HTML codes and CSS and various other bits and pieces they understand coding. They, they, we get these quotes, oh I can, I can know what it's like for a programmer now because I spent two hours doing a session on JavaScript and so I know now how difficult it is for a programmer. The truth of the matter is, uh, programming is a skill that you never learn and finish learning about. It's something that you have to continue and use all the time. Uh, I've been programming for pretty much 20 odd years now, maybe a bit more, and in that time I still learn something new every day. Um, coding or, or the, the process of creating a computer program is really just a form of problem solving um, and f solving that problem step by step and then using what you've learnt to then teach a computer how to do it. There's not actually any difference between teaching a person and teaching a computer other than the fact that you have to speak to them in a different language. It's like um, taking uh, if I was to take a group of French students uh, and teach them a certain subject, a certain item, I would have to speak in French rather than English. So I'd have to learn French first of all in order for me to understand how to actually put that point across to them. So the most important skill the student should really learn is how we actually solve the problem and how we go about solving the problem, not just the process of actually learning a new programming language. To try and um, show my view of what the year on code should actually be more like, uh, I've started producing these new web videos. Fingers crossed you should see these all uploaded at the same time, um, so therefore you can go straight from web video web02 to web3, 4 and 5. Um, and the idea is it will give you the step-by-step -step instructions on how to build a social network. But I'm not just literally going to say, right, here's the code to do this, here's the code to do that. I'm going to show you some of the problems that you'll come up against and then the solutions that I have found that work around these problems, not just a few lines of programming code. Hopefully this way will show you not just the end result of what a programmer ends up with, uh, but actually how they got to that end result, which is actually a much more important journey than just saying, well, if you type this line, this line and this line, you get a working system. So I'm going to call my uh, new um, version of Facebook if you like, the contact circle. Um, I call it this because uh, the, actually the year that Facebook was launched I created a social network uh, literally for myself and a few friends called the contact circle as while well, I was still at university. Um, it didn't work very well and no one used it but it did give enough information for people to be able to say oh look there's my birthday then, it's coming up then etc. Things that we now use Facebook for all the time. 
Uh, when you've finished going through these videos, you will be able to have the, the basic specification of a social network. That does not mean you are going to be able to create the next Facebook, but it does mean you will be able to understand some of the complexity that goes into creating a system such as the one that Facebook was originally founded on. So what we're going to do is look at the same sort of problems and solutions that you would find in a standard system. Um, starting with the registration system, um, by the way we're not going to create this in the order that I show it here either um, because that's not actually how programmers work either. It's, it's like filming a film. Um, when you create a film you don't create scene one, uh, act one, scene one. You s might start with a whole series of items at one location then move on to another one and actually it's going to be very similar to that in this form of programming. But from a user perspective the process is that they go through a registration system where they sign up, they then click on an email to validate, they then log into the system via a username and password. They set up a profile with a photo, where they work, whether at college, whether at school, a few status messages, and then they're going to search for people and friends to link up to that um, to themselves so that they can start building up their network. This video is going to be a very straightforward one, uh, quite a short one hopefully. Uh, we're going to look at setting up a, a project to start with um, and how we actually get started with the design of this and we're then going to create our first two objects, uh, login and user object. The next three videos after this one are then building the login control and profile page, finally attaching the database and putting some encryption on before we then add searching and adding friends. And that's everything in a nutshell that we're going to work on. Uh, as you can see I'm using a Mac um, and you can I can keep cutting to uh, a live view of me at the same time as doing some code in a version of Windows that I have running um, as a virtual machine on this Mac. So I'm only running Visual Studio 2010 uh, primarily because uh, again I'm making this video more for my students than for anybody else and this is the system that we currently use in the college I work in. Um, so let's get started. I've got um, some notes that I'm going to take uh, as I start producing my system. This is, if you like, a, a living design document, a very, very basic design document, not into any particular style. Um, and uh, we're going to start from uh, from scratch for our, our project. So, uh, create a new project, first of all. Uh, nice, simple and straightforward. Uh, depending on which version of Visual Studio you're using, depend on what you're going to have for your .NET Framework. This will work on everything from .NET Framework version 2 onwards probably. Um, we're going to create an empty web application. I'm going to use uh, .NET Framework 4 for this. And I'm going to start by calling it Contact Circle in the name and solution name. So we'll save that. Now we're actually going to add another project to this solution. If I open Solution Explorer, you can see I've created a completely empty um, ASP.NET application. On my solution though, I'm going to add another project. And this is going to be something called a class library. And I'm going to call this contact circle code. Now you may say, what is a a class library. Again, I'm going to explain things as I come up against them in the programming code rather than do, do like a tutorial on um, some part of theory of programming and then show you how to use it. Um, what this type of project is, a, a class library, this creates in Windows something called a dynamic link library or DLL and it's a file which means you can use it in more than one place. So if I write any code in this uh, project here for contact circle code, I can actually attach it to my website, but I could attach it to say a piece of um, Windows programming that I might produce in the future. So you can have like a desktop application which works for your contact circle as well. Um, and I might in a later video show you how to do those sorts of things. But almost all of the code that actually does important things is actually going to go into this uh, code library, uh, this contact circle code. The contact circle website is really going to be about sending the user's interactions to the code below it, which will be the contact circle code. Hopefully that will make sense as we go through. So let's start by looking at the, the first problem that we've got. And the problem that we're going to start by looking at is the login system. So, let's make a few notes on our login object. What does it have to actually do? This needs to allow 
a person to create an account. Sorry, not typing very well today. By uh, entering a username, password, and email address. The email address will then need validating by asking the user to click on a link and re-enter a password from an email we will produce from the system and send to the user via the email address they have entered. Uh, we will need to check to make sure that um, the username the user has selected has not been used before. Uh, this is the sorts of things that programs come up against all the time and you have to sort of double think from the user's perspective. For example, it might when you first create a login system, you might think, oh, I, what I need to do is create a username, password, and then it just goes into a database and it can log them in. You don't think about the fact that when you've got multiple users, uh, you ne might need to check to make sure that the username hasn't already been given out before. Um, we also might need to check, for example, that they've not used the email address before. If they have, maybe we should suggest to them, this email address has already been in use. Do you want us to reset your password or something like that? So we need to check to make sure the email address has not been used in the past. And if it has, suggest resetting the password for the user. Um, the next item is this uh, item called encryption that we're um, going to be looking at. Um, if we use a form of um, we can use a, uh, a form of encryption, um, a type of code, where once you've uh, encoded the information, you've moved it from uh, being something that someone can read to something that they can't read, um, the problem can be that uh, you might not want it to ever be brought back. Uh, it's probably not making very much sense. Um, there are two types of encryption, two types of secret message. Um, we can take the the start point, which is um, the information that you want to hide. You can turn it into a code, and then that coded message can either be turned back into information again if you use a certain type of encryption, or you can create a type of encryption which is specifically used with passwords, where once you have uh, turned it into a piece of code, um, you can never see that information in its original state again. Why we'll do this, I'll explain later, but the big important problem with this it means that if someone forgets their password, you can't then tell them what their password was because you have no way of getting that original password back. So what we will add is uh, we will need a system to reset a password if the person forgets theirs as passwords will be encrypted in a one-way system. We're actually going to use something called SHA-256. 256 represents how many bits uh, the coded message has within it. Um, and that's important for dealing with um, try people hacking it and trying to break it in the future. So what's our user object going to do? Right, user object. Um, we need to have a user ID. So um, it is initialized with a user ID identifier. This must be unique. From this uh, UID that I'm going to call it, unique identifier or user identifier, um, we can obtain um, all of the information that we will need for 
um, a profile page. And this information will be a current photo, other photos uploaded by the user, full name, so full name, surname, email address, and immediately some of you will be saying, well, hold on a second, I don't want my email address revealed on a, um, a social networking system. And these are the other considerations and things that a program has to make to do with security, etc. So that's the next thing that we are going to bring into this. Um, given security settings, update their password and security settings if they are on their profile page. How do we make sure they're on their profile page? Well, when we do the login, um, when they've logged into the account, um, their user identifier will match the user identifier of the uh, profile that we're looking at. And if the two numbers, two details match, then we know it's them. Um, notice we've allowed someone to create an account, email address, check to make sure, check to make sure, etc. We haven't actually said here about log the user into the system. So once they've actually done all the validation, we've not said about how we actually log them in. Um, so it's a good start point for what we're going to do. So let's actually create this. Um, the first thing then, I'm going to rename my class1.cs in my class library to login.cs. And it will say, you're renaming a file, do you want to perform a rename? Yes, I do. I'm then going to right click on contact circle code, add another class, and this one I'm going to call user object. So I've now got two tabs open, two different classes. Notice this one just says class, not public class. I'm going to be accessing this information, this object, in another project. So I need to make sure that my code is set as public. So what's our login code going to contain? Well, the first thing we're going to do is um, somehow register the user. At the moment, I'm going to use the word void, which means that this piece of code isn't going to return anything. But that will be changed as we build up our code, as you will see. So um, how about we have something called create an account? What information do we need to create an account? Well, let's just create some curly brackets, smooth brackets ready. Um, well, the first thing we're going to need is a string for the username, a string for the password that they're going to type in in the web browser, and a string for an email address. So what's the process that we're actually going to go through to see if we actually want to create an account? Well, first of all, um, does this username already exist on the system? I'm making comments in my code that's going to step by step tell me what I'm actually going to do in my code to create an account. So does this username already on the, exist on the system? If it does, warn the user that they need to select a different name. If it doesn't, uh, check the email address. Is there already a user with this email address. If there is, warn the user they can not create two accounts with the same email address, so they should reset their password. If there isn't, what else might we need to check? Well, let's have a think about it. Uh, the email address itself might not be a valid email address. It might not have the at symbol, might not be set up correctly. Um, check the email address is a valid one. We can use a special system uh, called regular expressions on um, to actually work out if that's correct or not. Um, so we're going to do, use that and, and check that we have got a valid email address. 
Um, if not, if the address isn't valid, um, tell the user to write an address correctly. So by this point, we've checked their email address, it's OK. We've checked their username, that's OK. Um, maybe we should check the password to check it's actually a strong password. Again, uh, if not, tell the user they should uh, create a strong password and give hints as to how to do this. If everything OK, we need to send the email to confirm that the email address is theirs and we are finished. So that's our code for creating an account. Now we have a look at this and say well is there any information that's ever going to be sent through? Well actually yes there's, there's going to be various different things. Um, we might have um, an error message that the uh, username already exists. Uh, we might have an error message that the email address is on a different account. We might have an e error message the address isn't valid. Um, the password might not be strong enough. Or it could be everything OK. Um, we could have this as what's called a string, which means we can write our own text. So for example, we can return OK if everything was OK, for example. But um, the problem with that is if we use C Sharp, which is the programming language I'm obviously doing this in, uh, capital letters and lowercase letters actually mean different things. So if we start by typing OK like this with an uppercase O and then later on we use lowercase O, it won't recognize them as the same item. So we want to try and make sure we keep this consistency. And in programming, consistency is absolutely key. So how can we do that? Well. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do, outside of this curly bracket for public class, I'm going to create something called an enumerated type. Um, and I'm going to call this me error message. What we can do is basically create a list of items. Um, and we can then use those in our code wherever we want to. So in this particular case, I'm going to make a list of all my error messages. There can only be one word in the list, you can't have a space. So my first one is obviously going to be OK, that's an error message that um, means nothing's wrong. Um, what other error messages? Well, user exists, email exists, email not valid, um, password not strong. Each one of them actually seems to make some English sense, if you like. It, although it's the computer d just reads these as numbers, uh, we're building this in a way that a, a programmer can understand in a nice, easy way as well. Um, password not strong. Uh, is that everything? Have we got? So let's just check again. Does this username already exist? Well, there we go. That's the warning there. Email address, yeah, if that exists. Um, check the email address is a valid one, email not valid, password strong, that all seems to mean that everything should be OK. So that's everything we need in our enumerated message list. Now we can add, by adding three forward slashes, a summary on this, which means that as we start using our message in other parts of our code, we can write a little piece of English text or whatever language you're, you're writing your code in that um, explains what this is actually used for. And we can just say, uh, this um, is used to return um, an error message or OK if no error. Sorry, I'm using an American keyboard on a British keyboard layout virtual machine, so my keys are slightly different. Uh, OK if um, no error occurs. So then instead of using a public string, I can actually return the error message instead. So now, when I say I want to return 
error message, I hit a full stop, dart, or period, and it gives me a list of all the items that I've got in my list there, and I can just select the right one to use. So I'm always guaranteed not to spell something in a different way. So um, if it does warn the user they need to, um, to select a different name, well, then it'll be um, user exists, for example. And you can see I'm starting to build this up, and it's going to come up with loads of error messages as I build this up. Um, let's do this one for uh, email exists uh, address not valid so let's now return address not valid at the moment it looks like oh well you're getting loads of errors things that aren't going to be able to be read because it's going to stop at this point here as soon as it returns something it doesn't carry on doing the right code so um, surely this is a, a pointless thing to do but you'll hopefully see as uh, as we start building this up uh, why we do it in this way because the next thing we're going to do is actually write some um, functions, some code for each of these different items so does the username already exist? Well let's have a look um, public, uh, we're going to run with a boolean uh, which means true or false so it's going to return basically a true if the user exists and a false if the user doesn't exist and we're going to write some code um, that actually checks this but we're not going to do this at the moment uh, we're just going to put a placeholder in at the moment so we're going to check the username and all I'm going to actually do at the moment for now just return false the user is not on the system because so I'm going to build this up over time as you can see so now on my create account I can do the the check does this username already exist on the system if user exists send it through the username equals equals true there's my code I can return error message user exists now I might in other other situations put an else if statement together so if do this otherwise do something else but I actually don't need to in this particular case because if the user exists equals true it then closes this piece of code straight away so it will only move on to this line of code that my cursor is currently flashing on if the user doesn't exist on the system already so I'm now going to copy and paste everything I've just done with user exists and check about email existing nice and easy I then just type and get the email address and again I'm just literally going to return false for now so I can just copy the if statement that I've just got paste it in but change it now to email exists and make sure instead of sending through the username I send through the email address and this time the error message is this email exists message so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to remove some of the code that I don't need and put the curly bracket closing curly bracket for this if statement after email exists so if it doesn't check the, is there already a user on the system okay so the email exists we're now going to do the same for email not valid so again I'm going to do another copy but this time I want to return true and say the email is valid So my if statement is going to be slightly different. It'll be if email valid email address equals equals false, as in it's not valid. That's the point where I then do the email not valid. So very, very quickly I'm writing code which will work and I can run and check without actually having to write the code that goes in the middle here for like user exists, email exists, email valid. I can do that later. Hopefully that should be understandable. So how are we going to do password not strong? Well, exactly the same. This time I'm going to copy email valid. Call it password strong. Keep writing string by mistake. 
And again, I'm just going to set it as being true at the moment. I'm going to just copy these first two lines this time. And make that password strong. Password not strong. Now if everything's OK, it's then going to get finally to this point here. I need to send the email to confirm the email address is theirs and finished. And again, send confirmation, public, void, send confirmation confirmation email and what we need to send it to is the um, email address and what we'll probably have to have some point there is a user ID because obviously there'll need to be something that identifies that user on the email. It's not going to return anything. So we're just going to say have placeholder for now. And the code is obviously then everything OK. We need to send the email addresses theirs. So we send the confirmation to the email address. But then suddenly you notice, well, hold on a second, we haven't got a user ID yet. And that's because we've not actually saved or created the account. So we've not actually said about creating the account. So I'm going to add a new string, user ID equals uh, create account um, on system. And that's then going to send through the username, password, email address. I'm just going to copy those through again. password, there's the email address. We haven't got a piece of code that does that yet as you may notice. Um, and then I'm going to change my statement there to say if everything okay need to create them on system then send email to confirm the email address. Let's put it onto two lines so you guys can see it. It's theirs. Create on system, and then we can send finally the everything okay message. So the last piece of placeholder we need to create is obviously our create account on the system and that's going to obviously return a string because it's returning a string as user ID so at the bottom here we're now going to um, just start putting together our code for placeholder and we need to add in let's say these are strings if I do go too fast at any point, remember it is a video, you can rewind it, fast forward it, do whatever you want to do uh, to try and work it at your pace. And what I'm going to do again for now is I'm going to return the number 1 in a string so that it's going to return an ID of 1. It could be something uh, um, a bit simpler than that as you may gather. So. Um, we've got our placeholders creating an account on the system etc. We've got our code for actually creating a login system. Unfortunately I've just had to I cut the video short by mistake. Um, I pressed the wrong button. So I've just stopped the video and I'm going to have to restart it um, from what I'm just doing. Um, I know for you guys it would just seem as a, some jarring of two different clips so apologies for that. Um, now I've got all my account information in for my login at the moment, so I've got my creator account and all my sub items that I've got here. I then going to look at these and decide, well, how many of these actually need to be seen from outside the code of class login? Obviously we're going to need to call create account at some point, but do we ever need to check user exists outside of this login system when we're not creating an account? Probably not. So I'm going to change the type from being public to protected. If I run this thought process through, in fact, all of these can be listed as protected and not as public. I don't actually want people to look at these pieces of code and therefore sidetrack, if you like, the create account. They could literally, if I leave um, send confirmation email public, in the code I could make a mistake and end up sending the confirmation email without actually checking or putting on the system anybody being um, where they should be. So. Um, 
I'm making sure the only public item is the, pub, the create account. The next thing I want to do is I want to try and make some comments which are going to be accessible for the people actually building the system, which is probably going to be me in this particular instance, but in the real world you never know how many people might be working. And again, if I press my forward slash three times, it automatically fills in some information. So I can write what I want to show up to another programmer as they use my code. This allows the creation of a new account on the system. And we can enter the username they have entered. Whoops. Um, the unencrypted password. And their contact email address. It returns OK if no error or an error message if there is a problem. Okay. Now we can just fold up our code by pressing this little minus button so it just hides everything to make it easier for us to actually see uh, what's going on each time. Now you can do the same thing and probably should do with all of these different items as well. This checks that the user doesn't already appear on the system. The username to check it returns true if the username is found, false if it isn't. There you go. I shall leave you to actually do the other items. I'm just going to fold all those up to make it nice and small. Um, we're going to build um, a user object as well in a later video. I'm not going to do it just yet. What I'm going to do now is attach this code to my contact circle code and actually create a very, very simple control. So references, I'm going to right click on add reference. And it should be projects first of all, contact circle code, hit OK. I can now use this contact circle code in my website. So let's create a default web page. Add new item by right clicking on contact circle. And web form, I'm going to be using master pages and web user controls in this project, but for now, just to make sure everything works OK, I'm just going to create a normal web page called default.aspx. And I'm going to write a username, password, email address. Very similar to the login system on Web01. So let's add in a text box. It's my username, text box to password, text box to email address. And then just going to have a button. I'm going to change the text on the button to create account. Let's call this txt username, txt password, txt email, bn create. Now we're not going to do any proper testing or anything like this at this point because all I'm doing literally is checking that I can connect to my contact circle code. So double click create account. At the top here I'm going to use add it to my usings my contact circle code and then I can just create my login ah ambiguous name we've chosen a name that appears in two different places a login web control and a login contact circle code so it doesn't know which one I need to use ah so what can I do well what I can do very simply and easily is change this from login to login user hit yes and now instantly my code actually knows which one to use. Use login user, which I've just created. So what I did was rename this file, say yes, and you'll see that it's automatically renamed the class to being login user. This is one of the benefits of doing things in a much more modular way. It's much easier to keep things under control. 
So how are we going to check that we can actually create an account? Well, there you go. If I type in log.createAccount, it comes up with a message. It even says this allows the creation of a new account on the system, like I've typed in. As I start then typing, it comes up with the description of what each of the items was that I entered actually in the comments themselves. So what we're going to do is get the username out of the text, username.text, text password.text, text email.text. And that's as far as I'm going with this video, first of all. Uh, we've checked that we can connect to our login user, which is correct. Uh, we've written our code and some uh, dummy code to make sure that our structure works OK for create account. Um, and then what we're going to need to do is actually add to this in a big way in the future. So uh, as a start point, we've got ourselves a couple of user objects. We've got ourselves a website ready to roll. And we've connected the two together. So our project is well on its way to starting.